Ja, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, nach dieser wunderschönen musikalischen Eröffnung möchte ich Sie 
ganz herzlich hier an der Universität Potsdam zur diesjährigen Euler-Vorlesung begrüßen. Mein Name ist Matthias Keller, ich bin amtierender Leiter am Institut für Mathematik und im Namen der Organisatoren und der beteiligten Institute freuen wir uns dieses Jahr ganz besonders, dass die Euler-Vorlesung nach zwei Jahren Pandemie endlich wieder vor Ort in Person und in drei Dimensionen stattfinden kann. Das ist mir eine große Freude, hier wieder Leute zu sehen. Und ein Relikt der Pandemie ist ja, dass wir mittlerweile digital so intelligent geworden sind, dass wir diese Euler-Vorlesung jetzt auf YouTube übertragen können. Das heißt auch ein herzliches Willkommen an die Millionen an dem Bildschirm zu Hause. <lacht> die Euler-Vorlesung wird heute Professor Wolfgang Lück halten aus Bonn. Da freue ich mich sehr darauf. Er wird äh, uns durch ein Panorama von L2-Invarianten führen. Und vorher wird äh, Professor Holger Reich von der FU die Laudatio halten. Aber zunächst freue ich mich, dass äh, unsere Vizepräsidentin, Frau Barbara Höhle, hier ist. Und äh, ich würde Sie auf die Bühne bitten, um ein Grußwort zu sprechen. Thank you for the introduction, Professor Keller. So I will switch to English. My, our office prepared my uh, speech on English, uh, even though my native language is German, but I assume that this is an uh, international audience, so I will switch to English because it's very hard to have notes in English and then present it in German. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear guests, uh, on behalf of the, I think I can take off my mask, <laughs> sorry, on behalf of the University of Potsdam, I want to welcome you to the traditional Euler lecture, which takes place for the 29th time this year. And I'm also happy that it can take place again here at the university in this really beautiful room. And also a welcome, of course, to, all, to the audience that cannot be here, but that is watching us uh, on YouTube. Um, Again, we are happy to welcome you here in Potsdam at this beautiful campus and at this beautiful location. Due to the pandemic situation, the Euler lecture couldn't take place uh, in this way the last two years. Uh, last year, the Euler lecture was only possible via Zoom, and the year before it was cancelled, uh, had to be cancelled. This year, two to three hundred participants are expected to watch the Euler. Last year, it was around 150. I would like to specifically welcome the following guests. First of all, particularly uh, this year's keynote speaker, Professor Wolfgang Glück from the Rheinische Friedrich Wilhelms Universität Bonn, who will give a speech on the topic, a panorama of L square, I assume, <laughs> invariance. Um, I, I, I stumble a little bit across this L square because in my uh, field, which is language, I would say L2, which means second language, but <laughs> I think L square is correct, right? <laughs> okay, and I like to welcome Professor Holger Reich from the Freie Universität Berlin, who will address the Laudatio to Professor Lück. Thank you very much for organizing this Euler lecture together with Dr. Siegfried Beckus. Moreover, I, I would like to welcome the members of the jury which are Professor Christian Bär from the University of Potsdam, Professor Gavril Farkas from the Humboldt Universität zu Berlin, and Professor Felix Otto from the MPI in Leipzig. And finally, Professor Matthias Keller from the Institute of Mathematics, who we already saw minutes ago, who will speak the closing words. The University of Potsdam is the largest university in, Brandenburg, in the federal state of Brandenburg, We have about 22,000 students and about 30% of them being international students. Um, we are, of course, number one statewide in research funding and publications, and we have a very uh, high status in technology uh, transfer and startup support. The university has three campus, which makes collaboration between different disciplines not too easy. So we are more or less here in the central location, the Campus Neues Palais, where our central administration is located and the Faculty of Arts. And then in the uh, east side of 
Potsdam, close to Berlin. There is the Campus Griebnitze, where the Faculty of Business and Social Science, the Faculty of Law, and the Di Digital Engineering Faculty are located. And then on, on the west side of Potsdam, the Golm Science Park, where the Faculty of Human Science, and for this event, the most important faculty, the Faculty of Natural Sciences, are located. The university has grown um, quite enormously in the last five years with two new faculties that were integrated into the university. One is the Digital Engineering Faculty, which is very specific because it's a private, um, it's a faculty together with a private uh, institution, the Hasso Plattner GmbH. And more recently, the Faculty of Health Science was established. And again, this is a, a, a somehow special format because it's a joint faculty of three universities uh, in Brandenburg. Mathematics is one of the strong research fields at uh, our university. We have a collaborative research center funded by the DFG, which is called Data Assimilation, the Seamless Integration of Data and Models, the speaker of which is uh, Professor Sebastian Reich. And this uh, research center was positive evaluated in the last year and got a second funding phase, which we are very proud of. And in connection to this center, there um, is also a new master program, data science. Further colleagues from the university contribute to the DFG priority program, geometry at infinity. The Euler lecture, and I think most of you will know that, in Sans Souci exists since 1993, and it was basically an enterprise to get the mathematicians, oh, hard word to pronounce for me, from this region, Berlin, Brandenburg, together uh, to this event. And I think that it's still alive, really indicates uh, its great um, success. So it's labeled after Leonard Euler, and I want to say a few words about Leonard Euler because uh, I'm not as I said, from this field, and I did not know him, I have to um, acknowledge before I prepared for these words. And I've, I found it really interesting that there is a very close connection between Euler and Sans Souci, and uh, maybe this is mentioned every year, but I see some young faces which may not know the story, and therefore I will uh, tell it here. So in the year 1741, Euler accepted a position at the Royal Prussian Academy of Science in Berlin, which was offered to him by King Frederick II, also known as Frederick the Great. However, Frederick was somehow dissatisfied with Euler's performance, and this culminated to what is sometimes called the fiasco of Sans Souci. Euler was requested to calculate the power of the gear train that was necessary to create sufficient power for a fontaine in this park, so in the park behind us, so to speak. But Frederick was not happy with the result. He wrote to Voltaire, which was a very close friend to uh, Frederick, Euler calculated the power of the gear train so that the water would go up into a basin, flow down again through channels, and rise in, a sans, in sans souci, so in a large fontaine. My mill was built according to all the rules of mathematics, and it could not pump up a single drop of water further then 50 steps below the basin. Vanity of vanities, vanity of mathematics. Uh, I think this is really a very nice example of the discrepancy between theory and uh, application, so to speak, because at the end, what people now claim is that it was not uh, the fault of Euler's calculations, but it was at the end a fault of construction, so uh, transferring basically the theory into the uh, into the construction of, of this fontaine. Okay, so all the Euler and Frederick brought up in this dispute, the Euler lecture is able to bring impressive and fa famous mathematicians to Potsdam. And I think the lectures provide uh, fascinating insights into different aspects of, math of mathematics uh, year after year. So the Euler lecture is considered as a highlight of mathematical life in, in the Berlin-Brandenburg region with a nationwide visibility and therefore receives versatile support. And I thank to all the institutions that um, 
support this event. I don't want to mention them <laughs> individually because these are universities. The, Bran the Brandenburg Ministry for Science is involved uh, and a number of other institutions. And again, special thanks to Dr. Siegfried Beckus and uh, Professor Holger Reich for organizing this and also thanks to our musicians, Zofri, Catherine, to vocals and Gonzalo Celis, I hope, on the guitar. So dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to welcome you again to the Euler Lecture and I wish you a very interesting afternoon and as Vice President for Research, Early Career Researchers and Equal Opportunities of the University, I wish the Euler Lecture every success also within the future. And now I would hand over again to our musicians. Thank you very much.
Yeah. Welcome, Wolfgang, to Potsdam again. So I was asked to say a couple of words about the scientists and the person Wolfgang Glück. So about Wolfgang Glück. <laughs> and uh, so maybe I tell you my first encounter with Wolfgang. So that happened in the year 1995. Uh, I was at the time based in Göttingen and I visited visited Mainz shortly after my diploma that was. And the purpose of my visit was actually to uh, learn what will be my thesis topic, so for the PhD thesis. And so I walked into his office in Mainz and he would welcome one with, uh, hello, möchten Sie einen Tee? So that was the, the usual thing. And then he would start to explain concepts and share ideas. And over the years I learned that um, that was the standard setup. So what you see here in the picture is the tea preparation equipment tool that would be always on his desk and it would be always in use. And there were many visitors after me and many students who heard this phrase. And uh, also, I guess, profited a lot from him sharing his ideas. But uh, let's get a little more serious and investigate a little bit uh, Wolfgang's career first in a very coarse overview. So the, the coarse trajectory. Um, so Wolfgang was born 1957 in Herford. Um, not that much is known about the early period, except it might be important that uh, when he was 17 years old, he started to uh, be a sailing instructor. Uh, in his free time. And, and then in 1973, so that's the blue dot, uh, that was important. Uh, he participated in the Bundeswettbewerb Mathematik and won a gold medal. And that is important for two reasons. Uh, first of all, he gave up his plans to become a professional soccer player. And second, he decided to study math. And so in 1975, after his Abitur, he moved to Göttingen in order to study math. And 1981, he did his diploma. In 1984, his PhD, Promotion, of course, both with distinction. In 1989, followed the habilitation. And at the time, it was actually uh, quite difficult to get a permanent position as a professor in Germany, so it happened that he started his first uh, tenured position 1990 in Lexington in Kentucky in the US. Of course, there was a strong desire to come back to Germany and only 15 months later, Wolfgang accepted an offer at the University of Mainz. In 1996, he moved to Münster and uh, since 2010, he's in Bonn. So that's... Uh, is the rough path and uh, the first layer of basic information about Wolfgang. And I'm sure that Wolfgang would agree that there's an even more important second layer of information which concerns his family and in particular his wife Sibylle who is here today because uh, they are throughout the years uh, there and give him a stable basis. And uh, the... Um, well, activities as a sailing instructor that we talked about it earlier led to um, a relationship with uh, Sibylle and in 1984, uh, the two get married. Um, four children were born in Aarhus, Göttingen, Lexington and Münster. And by now they're even grandchildren, as you see over there on the very right, I think three and five years old, something like that. Um, but and now let's move in uh, a little closer. Let's zoom in to the Göttingen period, uh, which lasted uh, 15 years. So um, uh, first I would like to mention that um, an important uh, influence and his advisor and mentor was uh, Tamu Tom Dijk, who at the time was one of the important uh, topologists in Germany. And uh, I think that was a very uh, yeah, influential person for him. And uh, I also, 
also should clarify that this, this rough trajectory, of course, in reality looks a lot more complicated. And there were, uh, in the postdoc years, there were uh, several longer research stays abroad. In particular, I'd like to mention Edinburgh, Aarhus, and Chicago, where he um, started to collaborate with Andrew Ranitsky, Ip Madsen, Mel Rothenberg. But of course, there were many, many other contacts uh, and people he started to collaborate with. Uh, in Göttingen, of course, also. Um, and I'd like to uh, single out two particular points in time, which are, I think, important for his two main strands of research. And uh, the first is 1988. So Götting was uh, um, in Chicago. And during that Chicago visit, he uh, had a visit to the Courant Institute in New York. And there he met Gromov. And uh, there, information, I guess, went in both directions. So Wolfgang, together with Mel Rothenberg, had just invented L2 torsion, so one of the L2 invariants that we will hear more about later. And he told Gromov about that, and I think he managed to impress him. Of course, we don't really know, but I think. And maybe more important is the other direction. Gromov told Wolfgang about certain conjectures about L2 Betty numbers. And Wolfgang was able to solve these a couple of years later. And so the so-called Gromov approximation conjecture is nowadays known as Lux approximation theorem. And I think that uh, had an important impact of Wolfgang's role in the field of L2 invariants. Um, and the second point in time is 1993. So somehow this uh, success with the uh, Gromov conjecture and other successes led to an invitation to an important Oberwolfach conference uh, with the title Novikov Conjectures, Index Theorems, and Rigidity. And that was a truly interdisciplinary meeting. So there were many famous names uh, from topology, operator algebras, and global analysis. And in particular, there was also Gromov. And um, that, I think, that meeting uh, somehow led to his second main strand of research, uh, which is centered about around assembly maps. Um, nowadays, they are also called the davis Lück assembly maps, and uh, the Farrell-Jones conjectures, and the Baum-Conn conjectures, and many other things. So, and somewhere between these two points in time, so around 1990, uh, I would say things really took off. So Wolfgang was already well established within the topology community uh, a lot earlier, but around the time, uh, a broader perception of his work uh, appeared. And uh, important was also, I guess, uh, his extension of the Chiga-Müller theorem uh, the comparison of analytic and combinatorially defined torsion and extension means extensions to manifolds with boundary and symmetries. Okay, um, so around 1990, as I said, suddenly many uh, things came together and there was an interaction between topology, in particular surgery theory, functional analysis, operator algebras, global analysis, um, geometric group theory, algebraic K-theory. And I think that is very typical for Wolfgang's research. And um, so his research is very broad, I would say. And here are some other characteristics of uh, his research. So <clears throat> there are always guiding conjectures and questions. And um, usually they are very easy to formulate and understand, but then they are extremely hard to solve and everything is allowed in order to solve them and you can pack out the big machinery to try to do something about them. Uh, then uh, I think everybody appreciates his extremely clear style. So you can really give an article of Wolfgang to an, a master student and uh, you have a lot less work than if it would be another article because uh, the master student has a lot less questions. Everything is defined, everything is uh, 
written precise and so on, and that's, that's really um, wonderful. Uh, then um, he's very strong in uh, summarizing and simplifying often whole developments. So uh, he does a tremendous uh, service to the community by writing survey articles, giving survey talks like today, and even organizing interdisciplinary survey conferences. So this allows uh, then the younger generation and people from other fields really to enter a field and uh, to get into a field where it's often quite technical if you if you only read the original articles with the results. Um, then, uh, well, that's very simple. Quality and quantity, I think that's just impressive. We'll hear some numbers later, some figures. And uh, lastly, his research is almost always collaborative. So research happens in teams. And um, collaborative uh, research happens in teams, but uh, teams of a reasonable size are typically not funded by the universities or by the universities alone. And uh, so st certain structures are important. And I imagine that already as a PhD student, so that's uh, the kind of first uh, yellow bubble there. Um, and as a postdoc, uh, Wolfgang profited very lot, uh, a lot from the CRC that existed back then in Göttingen. And uh, later in his career, he was throughout uh, his whole later career always a PI, a principal investigator, in larger DFG-funded institutions like uh, CRC's RTG in Münster and the uh, Hausdorff Institute in Bonn. But he was much more than a PI. So, he, um, I mean, after these early light-hearted postdoc years in Göttingen, I think he took on more and more responsibilities. So, uh, he was a spokesman of the RTG in Münster, a vice spokesman of the CRC in Münster, the first one in Münster. He was the driving force behind the follow-up CRC in Münster and its spokesperson for a couple of months before he then left to Bonn. From 2011 to 2017, he was the director of the Hausdorff Institute of Mathematics in Bonn. And since 2019, he's the spokesperson of the Hausdorff Center of Mathematics in Bonn. Um, 2006 to 2008, he was president of the German Mathematical Society, the DMV. Um, from 2014 to 2021, he uh, was a member and then later chair, sorry, from 2007 to 2021, he was first a member and then from 2014, the chair of the scientific advisory board uh, of Oberwolfach. And um, so I think that's quite impressive and it's kind of uh, the burden gets larger and larger, it feels. Um, yeah, so such an introduction would not be complete without a couple of words about awards. Here's a very small selection. So, 2003, the Max Planck Forschungs Prize. In 2008, the Leibniz Prize. In 2015, an ERC Advanced Grant. And there were invited lectures to the European Congress of Mathematics and to the International Congress of Mathematics in 2008 and 2010. And there are many more things to say, but uh, in the interest of time, I uh, want to leave you simply with some uh, numbers, some statistics, which are, I think, quite impressive and speak for themselves. So there are 137 publications in, uh, with uh, 65 co-authors, according to MathSignet. There are 27 PhD theses supervised by him, so successfully supervised. Uh, actually, the first thesis was Thomas Schick, whom you all also know very well. And uh, nine out of these former PhD students are now professors at universities in Germany, Germany Mexico, and the US. One of, uh, of them, that's me, of course. Um, his homepage lists 109 alumni, so people who spent uh, some 
time and were in some sense integrated in his uh, research group. And uh, yearly there happens a barbecue where probably not all the 109, but a couple of them come together and meet. Um, so that happened over the last couple of years. And of course now with a two year break and hopefully this summer there will be another one. And uh, there are 63 conferences co-organized by him. And uh, the number of conferences he attended is unknown. Um, and he's a world record holder, actually in two disciplines. So the number of uh, Oberwolfach's visits in the category scientific visits and the number of Oberwolfach visits in the category organizational meetings. Um, and now you, you have to imagine the timelines I've shown you in the beginning and then put the dots of 137 publications, put the dots of uh, 27 PhD theses and uh, I don't know how he does it. So it's, it's really uh, a miracle, but somehow this, this T seems to play a role. Um, yeah. Um, but maybe we come back very briefly to this um, slide from the beginning. So if you think about these Oberwolfach visits, that would, would mean an oscillating movement here between the dots and uh, the lowest new dot in uh, Oberwolfach. And actually there was a similar movement uh, during the DMV presidency uh, with Berlin. And yeah, I'd like to stop here and I hope that it became clear that the math mathematical community uh, owes a lot to Wolfgang Glück, and I would like to thank him in the name of all of us for this. And uh, additionally, I'd like to, I mean, given um, the remarks from the first slides about a stable basis with the family, and uh, the last remark about the Oberwolfrath visits, if you think about that, and compatibility with the family, uh, then I think I would like to extend this thank you to Sibylle, who's also here today. And uh, that's it. So uh, the stage is yours, Wolfgang. Can hear me? Yes, that works. Well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the jury, Professor Baer, Professor Farkas, and Professor Otto for nominating for this really very nice event. I'm really flattered and honored by this. I would also thank the musicians for the interpretation of Schubert. And I would like to um, thank for the Professor Kellner and Professor uh, Höhler for the, uh, um, let's say, uh, Grußwörter, I don't know the English word, but especially Holger, I must say, I've never heard such a nice laudate you than you were giving, um, personally and also very professionally. And you ask why I was able to do all this. Um, so you know probably that I'm really interested in talking about mathematics and relating fields. And in some sense, uh, this talk should be in this flavor. So I would like to give you a panorama of a two invariants. And they will do it in the following fashion. I will, in the first uh, round, state some theorems or results or conjectures which seem to be completely unrelated to L2 invariants, but we are rather prominent. And in the second round, I will try to explain why L2 methods are very important to prove them or give you a flavor where L2 invariants really pop up. And the nice thing about L2 invariants is that they really connect very different areas of mathematics, something I like a lot. The other advantage of such a broad uh, talk is hopefully that everybody of you at least will enjoy three minutes when I'm talking about something he knows a little bit better, but also will hopefully be able to say something who are non-expert and I'm clear most of you are non-experts. And I have prepared some slides, but there are more slides than I will present here. 
So uh, sometimes I will just say there is a slide and you are welcome to look at the my homepage. You can download the slides if you scroll to get more information. So you don't have to be worried that I will go through 40 slides in detail. It would be much, much for a one hour talk. The third part actually will be a kind of overview of what's going on. Because in some sense, within this one hour, I will only be able to cut in the beginning, unfortunately. But that's enough for you to be entertained. So, let me start with um, some um, results about group theory. So, I will also sometimes meet, make some meta remarks, which may be more valuable than the uh, actual results. One meta remark is, how do you start study groups nowadays? You don't look at the group multiplication table. So you either let the group act on a space, then you are doing geometric group theory. If you're letting the group act on a measure space, then you do a measure theory, theoretic group theory, or you are a topologist and you assign to the group this uh, space called BG. And now you can apply to it all pattern, all things we know from algebraic topology, something like homology, or the very prominent uh, left um, invariant there called Euler characteristic, which is very well to this kind of event. And the Euler characteristic is actually defined in terms of counting cells, but you should be used to the fact that topologies always count things with alternating sums. Right. But you can also count in uh, terms of the space BG directly, where you look at the homology of the space. If you don't want to know what homology is, that is something an algebraic topologist can assign to a space. We assign to a space a, sp uh, a, space, so a group, the space BG, then we get this uh, new number called Euler characteristic. And here is one very interesting result, which is due to uh, Jeff Cheeger and uh, Gromov. They showed if any group G, contains some normal infinite dimensional subgroup, then this invariant vanishes. For the experts, I want to emphasize that there are no assumptions about these normal infinite dimensional subgroups like being of finite type or whatsoever. Just the mere existence of this subgroup causes this uh, invariant to be trivial. Uh, for a group theorist or for an operator theorist, amenable is clear. For the non-experts, think about solvable groups or if you like, abelian groups, then this is still a very nice theorem. So this is a very astonishing result, which uh, I found very fascinating in the beginning. And um, I had no idea how this could be proved. And of course, you can imagine Chika and Gromov did this via L theory and L2 theory. You will come to this later. Here's another very interesting invariant coming from group theory. It's called the deficiency. The deficiency is some kind of invariant where you would think it's completely useless because the definition is so awkward. But the definition is that you look at all presentations of a group. It means you can describe a presentation by giving generators, that's the alphabet for the word, and you throw some relations into it. Now you're looking at all possible presentations, and you take the difference number of generators minus the number of uh, relations, and you want to have the maximum. When you're looking at the maximum, you can make this number always uh, smaller, just add some relations which are unimportant. But the maximum is this what you would like to calculate. And you can imagine that calculating the maximum or lower bound is easy. You find nice presentations, you count the numbers of generators, minus relations, and you have a lower bound. The problem is whether you have achieved the upper bound. And therefore, you would like to find upper bounds, uh, a priori upper bounds on the possible deficiency. For a group theory, the deficiency is a very natural invariant and it has been um, investigated from the 70s already. But even for topologies, it's very interesting because the next example I will show on the slide was for me and Matthias Kreck and Peter Seichner the uh, key ingredient in showing that there are two four manifolds which are up to homotopy a connected sum, but not homeomorphic to a connected sum. So one of these surprising connections between group theory and something which seems to be on the first glance unrelated, namely about manifold theory. So why is the deficiency a very, um, it's a dangerous invariant? Because um, I will give you a group and sometimes there's a God-given presentation. Right, where everybody would write on this presentation, otherwise you are a little bit crazy. But this representation is not what realizes uh, the deficiency. And this makes this invariant interesting, 
but also uh, very difficult. And here's a very nice example. Due to Metzler and to Martin Lustig, you're looking at the group Z2 cross Z2. That's the uh, direct product of two copies of cyclic groups of order two. You look at Z3 cross Z3. And now you take the free amalgamated product. So this is a typical constructions in group theory. And everybody who has some idea of presentations would write this presentation. Right? Look at this T0 and S0 are the generators of the first two things. S1 and T1 are the one for Z3 cross Z3. You see it's the reason why S0 squared equals T0 squared. But I have to implement also the commutator because this group is a direct product. And of course, I have to do the same thing for the Z3 cross Z3 factor. So we have this relations S13, T1 cubed, and S1, T1 commutator S1. And whenever you have a free product, you just put the presentations together. So that would, of course, think that the deficiency is minus 2. And here's a small exercise for you. Here's another presentation where I seem to have forgotten one relation, but it's actually the presentation which realizes the deficiency. And the existence of this uh, example actually was for us a starting point to get some information about manifold theory. Uh, it's a very nice exercise to sit down and figure out why this presentation, which seems to lack a relation, gives you the uh, correct group. That's something to download the slides and think about it. It's fun. So here's a good typical theorem where um, L2 invariants come in and give you theorems which on the first glance seems to be unrealistic. So I had this invariant deficiency, and I told you the problem is I would like to find an upper bound. And here is one upper bound. Suppose that you know your group is an extension of infinite groups, and you would assume G is finely presented, and you have to assume that the H is finely generated. So these are very mild conditions, right? If I write down this uh, kind of exact sequence, what do I know about G? I would say nothing. But this has the interesting effect that the deficiency of G can't be arbitrarily high. It's bounded by 1. And I will come to this uh, result later, or what it means. But um, this is a kind of flavor where you have mild assumptions on your group, and you get a very strong uh, conclusion, which makes you, of course, nervous. So now I would like to pass to a little bit different area, that is the area of manifolds. So um, the oil characteristic is for me the most basic invariance you can think about when you're looking at the W complexes. And what is the most uh, um, basic invariant for manifolds is the signature. So when you have a closed manifold, you can find a symmetric bilinear non generated pairing by the intersection pairing in the middle dimension. And you know your linear algebra course. You look at the number of positive eigenvalues, of negative eigenvalues, take the difference, and that's the signature. So the signature is one of the most important invariants, especially in dimension 4. But you may have encountered the notion of a signature when you talk about Borderson theory, for instance. And again, here is now. One relation you always have, namely the signature and the order characteristic, agree mod 2. That is not an accident, but there is some relation. But here's another theorem of this kind of flavor where you are rather surprised. I start again now with an object I want to investigate as the closed manifold, or dimension 4 now. And I'm assuming that the fundamental group satisfies a very mild condition. It should contain an infinite normal finally generated subgroup of finite index. Again, it doesn't tell you anything about pi 1 of m. It seems to be a very mild condition, which you can use for everything, anything but no. It turns out that then suddenly you have a very strong relation between the signature and the order characteristic in the sense that the value, after the value of the signature, is bounded by the order characteristic. So a much stronger relation than the mod 2 uh, equality. By the way, people who work on differential geometry, of course, you can get much more information in this spirit, but then you use, for instance, uh, manifolds with uh, have a condition on the Ricci curve or whatsoever. But here, the assumptions are very mild. So now I would pass to another area. I would like to pass to the area of algebra and representation theory. If you want to do this, uh, you have to understand what the group ring is. 
actually don't have to really understand it for this lecture, but I would like to give you some information. So you handed me a ring, and you handed me a group, and out of this I will concoct a new ring called the group ring, RG. Let me tell you what the definition is for completeness. It's um, given by formal finite sums, where you add out the elements of the group G, and you have coefficients. So as a module, it's just a free R module generated by G that gives you the addition. addition. But how you multiply, and there you see this uh, formula G times H equals G times H, with a tautological formula. Of course, it means that the dot on the left side is how you multiply in the ring, and the dot on the right side is how you multiply in the group. And for experts, this is just a convolution product which makes it into an algebra. So why are group rings important? They arise in algebra in a very natural way, and in particular, they arise in the theory of representation. The point is, when you look at the G representation over a ring R, it's the same as a module over the group ring. This also shows you first two things. RG is a very important ring. Secondly, it must be utterly complicated because it absorbs the whole theory of representations into uh, statements about modules again. And I personally believe in the invariance of difficulties in mathematics. So if you have a hard problem and you reformulate it, it stays a hard problem. But nevertheless, this is a point of view which is very important. So now I'm coming to a very famous old um, conjectures in algebra made by Kaplansky, which are about this complex group ring. So when you have a ring, um, there are certain reflexes you want to study it. You want to figure out whether it has idempotence. So idempotent means more or less that you have an element x, so that x squared is x. And this may be able, with an idempotent, to decompose your ring into smaller pieces. And the conjecture by Kaplansky uh, is that if you look at the complex group ring, there is no um, idempotent except the obvious one, namely 0 and 1, if your group is torsion-free. So this was one of the um, first basic uh, conjectures about group rings, and it's still open. No one knows the answer to this. But Kapazansky, uh, of course, made more conjectures, which become uh, harder and harder. You can ask even more. You can ask whether the complex group ring has zero devices. So a zero device in a ring is just given by two elements, x and y, which are both not zero, but the product is. And it turns out that one couldn't find any zero devices in the complex group ring of a torsion-free group, and then you make a conjecture out of it. Right? So there is none. And in some sense, for me, the uh, best conjecture is the hardest, but it gives you some insight what's going on, is embedding a uh, conjecture of Kaplansky he asked himself, yeah, what could be the reason for this, that I find no zero devices or no uh, idempotence? The reason is that the complex group ring embeds in the 2 sq field. This is some kind of um, more sophisticated conjecture, which also gives you a reason what is going on here, because uh, the version about idempotent conjectures and zero devices conjectures was simply we couldn't find any. Right, but he made this third conjecture, which I think is the important one. And of course, the third one implies the second one, and the second one implies the first one. This is not hard to figure out. But you see here, a completely different story. We are talking about algebra of rings. Um, as Holger mentioned already, I have, of course, Something else in my, on my heart is algebra K theory, but algebra K theory is not very good for a talk like this. But at least I want to mention uh, one result which I like a lot. I will tell you why I like it, and this is maybe entertaining. So for those who know uh, topology, uh, they know the Whitehead group. It is important in connection with the Escobarism theorem, but all you have to know is it's a group you can assign to group G, which has a kind of K1 theoretic flavor. And together with Michael Roerdam, I could prove that uh, now comes the point, you have any group G, and you have a normal finite subgroup in it called H, and then you have this kind of map from the co-invariants to G. And the statement is, this is always rationally injective. You may not be interested in the statement, but you may be interested in the story behind this. Because there's a 
as a, Holger, as I said, I'm really um, a big admirer of Gromov. And Gromov has to say that a statement about groups, which is true for all groups, is either trivial or false. And um, this is certainly non-trivially and hopefully non-false. I think we have a proof of this. But why is this very important? Also, Holger mentioned that I'm working on the Fell Jones conjecture. Whatever this is, is a very big and deep conjecture about algebra K theory of groups. And um, I've spent a lot of time on proving this conjecture. But meanwhile, I'm getting bored in quotation marks. I would like to find a counterexample. That is really, I think, is more interesting at the moment. But if you can find a counterexample, this will survive this kind of property. So, so the counterexample will never be something which is very stupid, because the Fair Jones conjecture cannot be true or comple uh, false completely. And also, I must say that I did also a lot of work with Holger together and with uh, Jean Rochnes and uh, Marco Borisco about this, detecting algebraic K theory by TC, whatever this is, where we have some results which are true in very large generality, and we also show that if we were able to find counterexamples, there can't be very stupid, right? Because many of the things are still true, but I'm also convinced that the Fell Jones conjecture, whatever it is, is not true for all groups, because Gromov, with his say, is right, hopefully with this small exception. So now coming back to another topic, it's differential geometry. Of course, since I know Christian Baer as well, I had to fill in some differential geometry. But I think it's a very nice uh, differential geometry. It's the old conjecture due, due to Hopf. So, completely different topic. I'm now looking at the closed Riemannian manifold, let's say of even dimension to n, and I would like to look at Riemannian metric. And of most of you will know that uh, the maybe dominant invariant you will get assigned to it is a section curvature, a very important notion in differential geometry, which gives you really the shape of, of a manifold. And uh, this conjecture is uh, in the arm of very nice connection between different geometry and algebraic topology. Because you may start with a smooth manifold, and you're asking yourself, can I find a nice remaining metric with a very nice property? For instance, negative sectional curvature, positive scalar curvature, and whatsoever. And this is really a really field which is active for 30 years and is still going on and has very interesting, uh, let's say, Result there. And what Hopf was asking is a sexual curvature something which will affect the Euler characteristic? Remember, the Euler characteristic was this very basic invariant given by counting cells, which is purely algebraic topology, but it does see some of the uh, remaining geometry, namely the conjecture would say if the sexual curvature is non positive, then the Euler characteristic is uh, set aside a certain parity condition. It's either always positive or negative, depending on whether it's the 2n, the n is even or odd. Again, exercise, think about all the surfaces you know, and check this conjecture. And if the sexual curvature turns out to be strictly negative, then actually um, Hopp believed that um, the Euler characteristic is actually not zero, zero, you have really a strict inequality there. So this is an open conjecture. There are no current examples to it, but uh, it's also something of kind of conjectures which really uh, led to many research acti activities. It's also a typical conjecture where I would say if you make a conjecture, the value of the conjecture is not whether it's true or false, the question is whether it was creating activities. And this conjecture has created activities. And there are many conjectures which have been turned out to be false, but they were nevertheless fantastic conjectures because people were working hard on them to find count example or to prove it in the beginning and learned a lot out of it. So I like to have conjectures uh, as a kind of, uh, kind of only know the uh, German word as a Leuchtturm in the mathematics, so yes, you know where you should go, because there is a nice conjecture which you will never reach, probably but uh, it shows you the direction. Here's another very nice, easy to stage result. Suppose you have a hyperbolic closed manifold. Hyperbolic means the sexual curve is minus one. So a very prominent example of manifolds studied in topology and different geometry. And you may ask how symmetric are these? 
And here's a rather surprising result, on the first glance at least, you will find no S1 action on such manifold. So when I'm saying an S1 action is trivial, I mean really trivial, right? So there is no point in the manifold and no element in the sphere is doing anything. So completely lazy. And this, when you think about nice spaces which pop up in your, uh, let's say, toolbox of manifolds, they usually have this kind of S1 actions, but hyperbolic manifold should never have that. And we'll come to this later. So here is something which is a little bit technical, but I also would like, uh, like to show the algebraic geometrists that they should be interested in L2 invariant. It's another uh, big theorem of Gromov. I will just uh, summarize it. When you have a closed Kähler manifold, there's a question whether it's an algebraic uh, projective variety or whether it holomorphically embeds into CPM. And Gromov could show this under very mild conditions about the fundamental group and just this vanishing of the second homotopy group. So also a very surprising result where mild conditions have a big effect be because being Kähler manifold and being a projective ver algebraic variety is a big step. But uh, Gromov was able to pass from Kähler manifolds to projective algebraic varieties and he did it via L2 methods, but I don't think I uh, have the time to say more about it because it's a really technical advanced paper. So this is in some sense uh, already the part, of part one of my talk, and uh, I could now answer questions, but I know this is very hard to take on questions in such an audience, but I'm happy if after the talk you want to address me. I love to talk about mathematics to discuss questions and also ask elementary questions. By the way, there are no trivial questions, there are only stupid answers. That is a big difference. So you may complain, but you can imagine what's going on here. The talk is about L2 invariants, but I have never used the word L2 really. If you present you many, many theorems or conjectures or problems where the word L2 didn't appear. And that's the point, right? The proofs uh, of these results actually do use L2 methods. And in most of the cases, there is no alternative proof without the L2 methods. Right? It's not so that uh, we have nice theorems which have been proven before, and then we found the proof using L2 methods. No, uh, many of these theory results really were only possible allowing L2 methods. And now I would like to give you a very brief introduction to the L2 setting. So now it becomes a little bit technical for five minutes because I don't want to save you from what you have to do to define an L2 invariant, but the good news is what I have really do then doesn't really matter for the rest of the talk, but you should get the flavor of what's going on here, where the L2 comes from. By the way, Professor, um, uh, from the, uh, the president was very nice, it's L2, it's not L squared. So I was amazed that she figured it out. So what is really lurking in the background here is really a big portion of operator theory, function analysis. And I think most of you have known what L2 of G is. That is a completion of the complex group ring to an Hilbert space where you just add enough elements to the complex group ring that you can talk about a Hilbert space and you have an inner product on it. What probably uh, only very few of you will know what is the phenomenon algebra of a group. And uh, you see the definition, which is maybe the right one, that would be you take the uh, complex group ring and you take a closure in a certain topology, the so-called weak topology. If you would close this in the norm topology, you would get the C star algebra of G. But now we want only to look at the weak topology and we get the phenomenon algebra, uh, which you can via the double computed and also described very explicitly. You would look at all operators from L to G to L to G, which are bounded and G equivariant. So for someone in uh, uh, operator theory, he would say, oh, that's a nice object, and it is, uh, because the reason why this is a very good object is the trace, whatever the trace is. But when you will deal with phenomenon algebras, then you will, this trace will pop up. So what you only have to keep in mind is, I'm completing the complex grouping to an algebra, and this is something you have maybe seen before. So when you want to study rings, you very often complete, you localize, or whatsoever. Here I'm uh, doing a kind of completion, but in the operator theoretic sense, not in the algebraic sense. 
and via this trace, this is very successful. And of course, Riemann, uh, the really um, reasons why von Neumann introduces the algebra actually comes from physics or comes from the uh, uh, Banach-Tarski uh, paradox, whatever it is. Oh yeah, I should say, the idea of a two invariance goes back to Atia. That he was really the father of a two invariance uh, in connection with the two index theorem. So I should mention this. But it was Gromov who popularized this uh, in the 90s, and suddenly people realized that this is really more than just an L2 index theorem. Okay, sorry, one more slide and you, uh, we are done with it. I have to tell you how I apply to, to spaces. Right? This was a setup where uh, operators here would be happy, but why is this important for spaces? If you start with a connected CW complex, a compact, let's say, could be a manifold, something you like. And now you go to the universal cover. It's something you may have heard before, that um, there is a covering assigned to X. It's simply connected. But now the fundamental group of X acts on this universal covering. And the quotient space is our original space X. For instance, take your S1. Universal cover is a real line. And the covering is what you think, where you run around the real line and you run around the circle. And you see that the pre-images of points are just integers. Let's see what you can do with any CW complex. And then uh, the apologies would look at the cellular chain complex assigned to it. Just a chain complex, something algebraic. And now I'm doing this completion process because I mentioned that the complex grouping itself is extremely hard, whereas the Van Neumann algebra turns out to be a very nice ring. Actually, except that it has uh, zero devices, for me, it's like uh, the integers. I would not have the time to explain this, but it's a very huge but very nice ring, much nicer than the complex group ring. So I also will apply this kind of completion to the uh, chain complex. So I now get an L2 chain complex of Hilbert spaces. Then I define the L2 homology in a pattern you all know, probably. Homology is always kernel divided by the image. But here I divide the closure of the image. And you can guess why, because I would like to stake in the rear arm of Hilbert spaces. And then comes the dimension theory, which was based on the trace, which allows me to assign to such an object a positive uh, a real number, a non-negative real number. So what you know about uh, the dimension of a complex vector space has a vast generalization to Van Neumann algebras, which allows you to apply this to a completely different setting. But the important thing is, when you think about the linear algebra course you had, long time ago, or not so much time ago, this is always an integer, a natural number, right? The dimension of vector space is an integer. Here you could a priori get square root of two, or any irrational number. And I will be coming to this later. So now you're allowed to forget this definition. That's nice, right? So now comes another thing, kind of meta um, remark I like to make to students in particular. So suppose uh, you have invented a new invariant, and at one uh, point in your life you will have invented a new invariant, and you are very proud of it. But now you have to check the reality. So there are two things you have to do. If it's a generalization of something classical, you should check that it has the nice properties as a classical invariant has. Then, if you are in good shape, you may even show it has better invariants. And then the third, of course, the fantastic result would be you can do things with it you couldn't do before. That is the stage how you should check what you're here doing. And of course, L2 invariants are just generalization of Betty numbers. And I hope that some of you know what a Betty number is. You just take a space, take the classical complex homology, nothing fancy, and take its complex vector space dimension. That is what a Betty number is. And here are some basic properties I've written down for Betty numbers. Betty numbers are homotopy invariant. So in uh, topology, there's a notion where you view uh, two spaces as equal if they are homotopy uh, invariant, much uh, uh, more uh, weaker than being homeomorphic. But uh, the Betty numbers cannot distinguish uh, spaces which are homotopy equivalent. And now comes the very famous euler poincare formula, which tells you that I can compute the Euler characteristic in terms of the alternating sum of the Betty numbers. Remember, the Euler characteristic was counting cells. That has no chance to be a homotopy invariant. But the right side is obviously a homotopy invariant. 
And very important is Poincaré duality. So when you have a closed manifold, Poincaré duality says that something in dual dimensions are equal, and here the uh, statement is very easy. The Betty number in dimension n is equal to the Betty number in the dual dimension with the dimension of the manifold minus n. So these are the three most important properties of Betty numbers, uh, which really keep you going and why they are very useful. And now here is the L2 setting. Oh, oh that's a pity. Oh, no, here it is, sorry. This was my mistake. So now you see what's going on. That is changing the um, theorem by changing the notation. Right? And this is okay. So the L2 Betty numbers, but notice they were defined much more complicated in terms of universal cover are multiple invariants. They satisfy the euler poincare formula and they are dual in um, dual dimensions, so they're dual. Unfortunately, uh, there is no proof by changing the notation. The proof of this fact, this slide, is completely different than the proof from the other slide where you have ordinary Betty numbers, right? But nevertheless, we could use the ordinary Betty numbers as a guide to what we would expect from L2 Betty numbers. So that would just say, very nice, they passed already our first test, whether they have good properties. Let's co continue. Um, you may have heard about the Kunnel formula. It is just a way of how to compute the L2 Betty, the Betty numbers of a product. Just this kind of nice formula, where the Betty number of the product is just given by the Betty numbers in dimension p times q, you add them all up, well, and p of q should add up to n. And we also know what the zeroth Betty number is. Since my spaces are connected, it's just one. Now let's try whether this works out again. And if you look at this, something happens downstairs, right? Upstairs is okay. What happens downstairs is, now we get something different we get not one, we get one over the order of the fundamental group. But this has the effect that this is very often zero if the order is infinite. For me, one divided by infinity is zero. And now you see the first time that the L2 Betty numbers behave completely different from ordinary Betty numbers. And um, the slogan here is roughly speaking, L2 Betty numbers are very often zero, but not too often. Actually, on the contrary, uh, they have the right balance of being zero in some situation and not in other situation, and this makes them so powerful for applications. S and here is a new property, uh, which uh, usually better numbers do not share at all, and this is really uh, which keeps you going when you are in the L2 world. It's the last statement, and I would like to go through it uh, really in detail. So you have a final covering of D sheets. That means you have your space Y, you have a space above it, X, you have a map between them, and the pre-image of each point here is roughly speaking the same number of points there. Like S1 covers itself by the map Z goes to Z to the D. And now you can look at the better number of the base space or of the total space, and they are related by this relation that the L2 beta number of X twiddle is D times the L2 beta number of Y twiddle. And this is completely wrong for, beta num uh, for ordinary numbers, beta numbers. And this is uh, one property which really is very useful and will make a big difference why sometimes L2 beta numbers give you much more information than ordinary beta numbers, also for computations. Notes their definition was very complicated. You will never compute an L2 beta number by going through the definition. That is, happens rarely. But the properties, they are very good. But it's like ordinary beta numbers. When you want to compute an ordinary beta number, I don't think that you will look at the singular chain complex and make a computation there. You will just use some machinery. So now I would like to give you a flavor why this a priori and the loosely defined invariant has much to do with algebra. So I will give you now a different definition of this uh, L2 Betty number in terms of an algebraic construction, but of course in a very special case. So I will now look at the CW complex as before, but I will only look at the fundamental group Z to ZD. So the fundamental group is a billion uh, of uh, 
uh, for rank D and tall to three is very special, but this is a very basic example. So what can you do now algebraically? Suppose I have never told you how you define algebraic numbers, but you would like to do something on the level of the universal coverings. So what you can do is you may look at just as the ordinary homology H n of x twiddle. There's nothing fancy here. It's not um, phenomenal. It's just what you know. On this, the group ring acts. Remember, we have this action of the fundamental group, in this case, the D on the universal covering. This acts on the homology. So I have this module there. And now comes this uh, notion of ZZ2 uh, up to zero. It's just a quotient field. When you all know how you get Q out of Z, right, by implementing certain denominators to make Z into a field. The same thing you can do with any commutative uh, field without zero devices, like the complex group ring. It has a preferred so-called quotient field, which you can pass through. And I'm passing to this quotient field by tensor rings. This is a kind of algebraic operation. But now I'm over this Q field, and what you have learned in the algebra is the notion of a dimension of a vector space over a field. And this works perfectly well over Q fields. So I could look at the classical dimension of this expression. And this turns out to be the l 2 Betty number. And this is, of course, intriguing because the definition of the l 2 Betty number was completely different and more complicated, but sometimes you have such nice interpretation. But the point I want to make is the last line. You see, the l 2 Betty numbers are not at all supposed to be integers. There could be anything, and often they are. But here, because the dimension of a vector space over a field is always an integer, there are integers, of course, natural numbers. So this shows you, oh, there's some kind of rigidity going on. And this is a kind of point in mathematics which very often occurred. You have some invariant who realize the invariant doesn't take all the values you should expect, and suddenly a new theory pops up. For instance, index theory came from the uh, vanishing of a head genus, Gina generator. So there are many, many cases where you see not every value occurs. You are curious as a mathematician, you want to understand why. And when you understand the why, you suddenly have a very new and fruitful theory. And something like this happens here as well. So sometimes you see this kind of key observations in rather elementary situations. This proof is not so hard. I could give it, I could give it in 10 minutes, but it pre-shadows really important developments. So now I'm coming back to uh, what I did in the first round. I was mentioning some theorems, which hopefully found, uh, sound like they are interesting. And I told you, yeah, but the proofs use L2 methods. And I would like to give you some flavor why this is the case or not. So we're looking at this uh, result. We have a so-called spherical manifold. What is that? That means you have a closed manifold whose universal covering is contractible, or multiple theories would like to prefer saying all higher multiple groups are trivial. Such objects occur very often in nature. For instance, any manifold which allows a non-positive sectional curvature metric is a spherical. So they are, they are very often. But now suppose you have a non-trivial S1 action on the manifold. That means I have an S1 action where at least one point, some single point is moved a little bit by some element in the S1. Then already, this forces your action to have no fixed point at all. So it's almost free. And of course, for us, the interesting uh, conclusion is the second one, that all l 2 beta numbers are zero. And notice that the all characteristic can be computed as the alternating sum of the l 2 beta numbers. But if all the l 2 beta numbers are zero, the all characteristic has to be trivial. So just from the mere existence of such a non-trivial S1 action on a circular manifold, I get that the all characteristic is zero, and um, there are no fixed points for this action. I'll come back to this later. Now, I have to remind you about something uh, which is uh, one of the first nice connections between algebraic topology and analysis, namely the so-called Hodge-Diram theorem, which I think when I learned it in the, well, maybe in the fourth or fifth semester, I found very fascinating. And I just try to recall what it says. So again, you start with a closed remaining manifold. 
On this many manifold, there is a God given operator called the Laplace operator, delta n. And you may ask yourself, what are the forms on which, um, which are in the kernel of these operators? You could also say, I'm looking at a solution of a differential equation. And this is so called a harmonic form. So when you have a form, dimension n, which is in the kernel of the Laplace operator, is the so called harmonic form. And now there is, in my uh, view, a fantastic relation between this space of harmonic forms and ordinary homology with real coefficients, namely they are isomorphic. And notice that the homology of M with real coefficients is not invariant. It doesn't see much about the metric. The left side depends heavily on the Riemann metric, a priori at least. And now you see that these things are isomorphic. So the solution to the uh, equation whether the Laplace operator of a form is zero is actually a very um, rigid uh, question. If you change your manifold up to homotopy, it doesn't change anything. And important for me is um, the corollary out of this, which also gives you a very nice relation between Betty numbers and a really uh, global analysis. It's the, about the heat kernel. Again, you should look at just at the formulas and then we give you some explanations. Left is the Betty number. Remember, defined in terms of simple complexes, very algebraic, easy to compute. The left side is a heat kernel. I will say more about it later. And you integrate a certain expression over the heat kernel, over the manifold. And now comes the important point. You take the large time behavior of this. So what is the heat kernel? Well, I'll li like to explain it as follows. Suppose you have a manifold. And suppose it is made out of iron. And iron conducts heat. Right? And now I have to tell you what the heat kernel does. And the heat kernel has three entries. The T is for time. The first value is X, and the other value is Y. And how can I give you an interpretation, at least in dimension zero, I should say. So I take a very a needle, very hot, actually a delta distribution for the mathematicians. I have a model of a manifold, and I just make this at the point X. Now I wait T seconds and look at the point Y and just check how much heat has occurred there. You see the heat is distributing on a manifold and the heat kernel tells you from X to Y the heat flows and after T seconds the portion I started with shows up at the um, point Y after a certain time. And if you look at the expression X comma X you ask yourself how much heat stays at the same point. Right? Now I'm integrating this so I would like to get an idea what happens. And now look at the large time behavior. And large time behavior always means I'm looking at a kind of large scale geometry. So I would like to understand my manifold globally. For, lo for small times, it's very well understood how heat uh, transforms. But for the large time, you can imagine that the heat goes around on your manifold. It explores it. It sees the holes in your manifold. And after some time, it will reach a kind of equilibrium. Right? And that is what this limit for T and infinity really uh, investigates. And what the heat kernels really does see, it does see the Betty number. And you may have seen that the Betty number, for instance, of a surface just counts the number of holes. So here we have an, uh, a, a way of how the distribution of heat on a manifold explores the geometry of the manifold. So a very nice connection. But of course, again, look at this surprising fact. The right side is really not something which you would think is always an integer. But we know the left side is. And this is really surprising. So now what happens in the L2 setting? Sorry, I have to check the time. So I'm doing well. Yeah, now you can say it's play the same game, right? So there is an L2 version of all of this. Um, I will not say so much about it. The proofs are completely different, and they were much uh, uh, more recent. But for the he trace, you have some formula like this. But notice that the M has now become a fundamental domain. And what is fundamental domain? You have your universal covering. You have your manifold below, and the fundamental domain is something which looks like the manifold upstairs, but only up to measure zero. But more or less, it looks like the part you see below. 
And now this by one action, you move this fundamental domain around, and then you get a tiling of your manifold upstairs, which tells you how the manifold is glued together by these parts. And since I have now this fundamental domain there, there, suppose I have this manifold, I heat up the fundamental domain, but then the heat will go everywhere, and if the manifold is non-compact, it should be zero in dimension zero, and that's true. The algebraic numbers were always trivial when the uh, fundamental group was infinite. And if the fundamental group is finite, there was one over the order of the fundamental group, but this is due to the fact that your manifold in this case is this uh, number times the fundamental domain. And if you start on the uh, fundamental domain, you let the heat flow, you will have the heat easily distributed, but the heat has of course don't gone down, because now where you have to look where the heat has gone is uh, d times as much as you have seen before, it was the order of the fundamental group. And again, this uh, question uh, arises, what are the possible values of the left side? So now comes a very interesting uh, results. Dodgic was the first one who would really make a non-trivial calculation with the algebraic numbers. He could compute them for uh, hyperbolic manifolds. And what he was getting is a phenomenon which is uh, actually still a very mysterious and important. He showed that the algebraic numbers is zero in one exception that you are in the middle dimension. So if you have a hyperbolic manifold, it's odd dimensional, you will always have zero. If it's even dimensional, you have the middle dimension, and there it is actually positive, for sure. How did he do this? Yeah, you have to know that any hyperbolic manifold has the same universal cover the hyperbolic space, and there you have to make a single calculation whether you find some L2 form or not. And this is not so hard on the uh, hyperbolic space because it's very symmetric. So this differential equation I was mentioning uh, boils down to a one-dimensional uh, radial equation, and that was the uh, key he was proving. So now here's a corollary out of this. So you start with an hyperbolic closed manifold of dimension D, and now suppose uh, the dimension is even, and then we get this equation here. But the reason for this is now there's an explanation for that. Because if you're thinking about the Poincaré formula, the order characteristic was the alternating sum of the Betty numbers. But there is only one Betty number in the middle dimension. So Hobbes expression minus 1m times cm is just the Betty number in the middle dimension, and this is of course by definition non-negative. So this explains why, at least in the hyperbolic case, you get this inequality. And actually, here it's even strict because uh, Dodgic showed that the beta number is really positive. So you see here now also a kind of explanation of the Hopf conjecture, you may remember. I started with the Hopf conjecture, conjecture, saying nothing about L2. But in hyperbolic manifold, it can be verified like this. And you have also an explanation why uh, it should be true, namely that all elevated numbers are trivial, except in the middle dimension, but then minus 1m times the oil characteristic is this Betty number, which from its very definition cannot be negative. And also we have shown that we have no S1 action on the hyperbolic manifold, namely, uh, remember, I told you that hyperbolic manifolds are spherical. I also told you that an S1 action kills all elevated numbers, but if a hyperbolic manifold has a positive elevated number, it can't have any S1 action. Right here. Now you see this was one of these things I started with, where I said an hyperbolic manifold cannot have any non-trivial S1 action. And the proof via L2 method is simply that um, you show that an S1 action kills all L2 invariants, but another computation shows, no, there can't be zero in this dimension case. Uh, by the way, this theorem, as it stands there, was known before. This is something you don't, you have to use L2 methods. You could use uh, the Hitzebuch proportion proportionality principle, but I will not say anything about this. So here is a result which I will skip. It's a computation of the L2 beta numbers in, uh, in um, dimension three. But here is the consequence out of it, if you believe this computation. Namely, if you start with a manifold of dimension n less or equal to three, and assume its fundamental group is torsion free, then all algebraic numbers are integers. So we ag again encounter this, uh, the result that for torsion free fundamental groups, all algebraic numbers are integers. And of course, then you ask yourself, is there a reason for this? 
And this is uh, actually what I want to tell. Maybe for time reason I will skip this. Actually, I started uh, five minutes before three, is that co correct? I see I'm, I'm hating going over time. That's something I do not want. So I will give me, if you don't mind, 10 more minutes. Is that okay? Good. Then I would like to spend uh, the hard part uh, on the Atia conjecture. And here is the conjecture you can really imagine I would um, uh, now come up with. You're starting with a torsion-free function presented group. And this group satisfies the Atia conjecture if for any closed many manifold, which has this group as a fundamental group, we have integers as algebraic numbers. All right. At the moment, the support for this are merely computations. And whenever we computed it, it turns out to be true. Question, is this an accident? Or can we find counterexamples? Or what is going on here? And um, so this is uh, what I like to call the fundamental square, because this is, for me, a very fascinating connection between geometry, operative theory, and um, very hard ring theory, actually. So what is the square about? The left upper corner is a complex group ring. Remember, this was our basic uh, object. We could compute it coming to the von Neumann algebra, which is on the right side. It's n of g. And the capacitive for normal algebra made it pos as possible to uh, go to the definition of algebraic numbers. Now comes the right lower corner. For an operator theory, uh, per person would be the algebraic affiliated operators. For non experts, think of this as a kind of coercion field. It's not quite true, but it's something like this. And now comes another object, which is uh, familiar for ring theorists, but not for other. Uh, areas is the so-called division closure of CG in U of G. I don't mind what this is. You get a very nice square, right? It's also nice. And you see that I have uh, two ways of going from CG to U of G. I can go to the von Neumann algebra world or to D of G. And now comes really the explanation for that here conjecture, what it really says for a torsion regroup. Namely, the Atia conjecture holds exactly if D of G is a skew field. And here you see now a conceptual reason for this. And you may remember that I made this calculation for Z to the D, where I told you the algebraic numbers can be computed in terms of the uh, dimension over this field, this quotient field, and this is really what's going on. Namely, the reason why the algebraic numbers should be integers is that you can say, tell them as a kind of uh, dimension of a certain skew field of a certain chain complex. And uh, proving this, as it was a programmer linear, actually with Holger really worked out in details, and I think Holger's thesis was the first paper where you could really understand what linear was doing, is to make this uh, really rigorous, and also to show that uh, the equivalence of the statement that the skew field exists if and only if um, you have this uh, integrality of the better numbers, and moreover, this fascinates me personally, in this program, there's hidden some algebraic K theory. And this is something you would not expect, that you apply algebraic K theory to a problem, which was about the heat kernel of the Laplacian on the universal covering. These are the kind of surprises which I personally like really very, very much. Um, I will not say much about the status of this conjecture, but I should also warn you, warn you if you drop torsion-free, then you can have irrational numbers as algebraic numbers. So you may think that it's always limited. It's not. We have no idea what the possible algebraic numbers are in the case where you have no constraint on the fundamental group. If you say torsion-free, there should be integers, but that's it. It's a very strange thing which we actually not at all understand nowadays. And there's a lot of research going around. I should mention at least uh, three names which made, uh, four names which really made uh, substantial progress. I think Linnell and Schick really proved a very important result. It shows the Atia conjecture for all torsion-free elementary amenable groups. And this is a really a reasonable large class of groups where you would say that's something where you really can start with, where you can really work. And there are situations where you would like to know that the Atia conjecture is true because you want to apply it. And yes, 
there you have it. I'm thinking especially of three manifold groups, for instance. Now the Atiyah conjecture is known for all three manifold groups, and that was uh, a kind of door opener. And very recently, uh, Yaikin and Zapparain, who is actually a ring theorist, uh, proved the Atiyah conjecture for all groups which are locally indicable. Again, for the group theorists, it's a very uh, well-known notion. Uh, many groups are locally indicable, but it's very hard to figure out whether certain classes are locally indicable, but one related groups are. So we know now that here conjecture for all one related groups uh, using the result of Yaikin and Zapirwein. So this is all I want to say about this, and I would like now actually come to the outlook. So there are many things I'm skipping here, but I told you I'm doing this on purpose. If you are intrigued, go to the slides. So the first, I think I have to apologize because there are many, many good mathematicians whose name I have not dropped here, which I should drop, because they have made fantastic uh, contributions to this field. But in some sense, I'm lacking the time to explain these uh, applications. And they are sometimes also very technical, and that would not be uh, the right uh, thing for an audience. But let me give you some, at least, highlights. I think a breakthrough result was by Gedeemin Gabayo who showed that the l 2 beta numbers are up to scaling measure equivalence classes. Again, remember this kind of meta um, uh, remark I made. When I'm looking at group theory, you don't look uh, at a multiplication table and then find out what your group is. You let your group act. So if your group acts on a space, prefer a metric space, you can apply geometry and you get so what's called geometric um, group theory. If you let your space act on Probably, um, let's say, it is. measure spaces usually with probability measure, you get measured group theory. Both are very successful. And uh, there's a notion of a measure equivalence class of such actions, a very prominent um, notion. But no one could distinguish two groups in this equivalence class. And it was a big breakthrough that people had discovered that the l beta numbers, which can be defined in this generality, do distinguish these kind of classes. So the first invariant, which really uh, was uh, put hands on distinguishing these classes wo uh, was, was true because of Gabriel showed l 2 beta numbers are the right things to do. And of course, I have not really talked about von Neumann algebras here, which I should have done because you can imagine that the theory of von Neumann algebras enters a lot. But I really want to mention uh, that Popa actually in the last 10 years uh, made some breakthroughs concerning problems about von Neumann algebras. He solved, uh, solved a certain conjecture about con by of fundamental groups of von Neumann algebras. But for the topology, the fundamental group of von Neumann algebras is not what you think. But there were open conjectures. And Gabriel was a door opener for Popa to get really deep through results about von Neumann algebras. Uh, really absolutely outstanding and prominent uh, problems, mainly due to con. Here's one uh, thing which uh, is also very intriguing and interesting. Uh, there is a, maybe the one of the most important open problems in phenomenon algebra is a question. Uh, you give me two free groups, and I tell you the phenomenon algebra are isomorphic. Does it imply that the groups are isomorphic? No problem for CSR algebra, so for complex group ring, but this is indeed an open problem for phenomenon algebra. And um, you see, uh, there are certain realizations of these dimension functions, and that actually made Korn and Schliatenko made a very bold guess. So they could define algebraic numbers for von Neumann algebras. Just you hand me a von Neumann algebra, I do not know it comes from the group, they could define something which are algebraic number like. And if one could show that if you apply this to n of g, that would be the algebraic numbers of your underlying group then you would have solved immediately the, uh, this problem about whether two uh, von Neumann algebras of two free groups are isomorphic, if and only if the groups are isomorphic. By the way, this is very basic, because there is a huge industry of people working on so-called free probability. You know probability in the commuter setting, when the variables uh, are commuting. That is in something doing um, meta-theoretic, uh, probability, and phenomenal algebras are in some sense the uh, non-commutative analog of measure theory. And there's this so-called free probability theory. 
But suppose you have a system which depends on n variables, and you have another system which depends on n plus one variables. And if your setup are, is isomorphic, in other words, the phenomenal algebras were isomorphic, that would give you strange uh, phenomena which you would not like to have. And therefore, it would be very nice for the free probabilitist that one can show that the phenomenal algebras do see the free groups, but they can't. It's an amazing uh, problem, but when you see for the first time, you think, I'm sitting down and we'll give you proof. And after some time, you will realize uh, there's a good reason why other people failed. Um, the title was about L2 invariance. And um, there's a complaint we have only seen one, the L2 beta numbers, and I will also confine myself to that. So there are notions of L2 torsions, uh, which are topologically due to Luke and Rothenberg, and the uh, Luke version were by Lott and Mathai, and there was a big theorem by Bogelia, Friedlander, Kappler, and McDonald's, which identified them. And it was also a door opener to many, many other things, which I will not really have the time to talk about. Very recently is a very nice connection to number theory. It's a conjecture by Bergeron Bengatesh, which more or less relates the L2 torsion to uh, torsion of molecular growth. I will not say much about it, but this is a very active field, but unfortunately the conjecture is completely open. It's not even one single case where one could prove it, but one also has no count examples. But it yields a very nice connection between number theory and this L2 methods, which is completely not understood. You can also try to do everything I'm doing here in characteristic prime, a P characteristic. Like you can do periodic representation theory, and there are Framidi, Oku, and Schreve did some very nice uh, work very recently. I also really like the work of Christopher Deninger and Lee Andreas Thom relating L2 invariance and so to entropy and other things uh, where I could now open a whole chapter. Uh, myself and Stefan Friedel applied universal L2 torsion, whatever this is, to three manifolds and get very nice relations to L2 torsion and Sorsen polytope. Sorsen polytope is one of the basic invariants in dimension three, which uh, yields out a polytope in the first commodity of your manifold. And very re recent, David Kielak, uh, uh, working on geometric group theory, applied L2 methods to get some very interesting result about Beery Neumann Strebel invariants. And first of all, and the last one is, it's quite nice that one of my former PhD students is here. Because uh, 20 years ago, I made a conjecture which was motivated by Gromov, which uh, says if in a spherical manifold has simp uh, vanishing simplicial volume, whatever that is, it should kill all L2 invariants. Uh, this conjecture is only based on calculations. And the simplicial volume comes from a completely different angle than L2 invariance, whatever it is. And Marco, who is sitting there, gets a task for me to and not to prove this conjecture, but to say, get more and more information about it. And actually his PhD is still very often cited. I don't know where you know that, but it's still uh, one of the starting points. And unfortunately, um, some of my students, like Clara Loew, were not able to prove this conjecture. They are still working on it. And why is it important to have such a uh, conjecture proven? Either it's disproven, okay, then we are done. Or it's proven, but then there would reveal a very strange connection between the world of simplicial volumes, which is about bounded cohomology and the L2 aspects again. We have no idea what should be the bridge. It's still very unclear, but we can only confirm this uh, conjecture by calculations, which is also very unpleasant. It would be nice to have a count example of what we can find it. And again, here is something going on which um, we will maybe not solve, but working in this direction has really uh, had many, many fruitful um, things going on. I think it's a good place to stop. Thank you. Ein großartiger mathematischer Vortrag, der zeichnet sich ja auch dadurch aus, dass er nicht alle definitiven, endgültigen Antworten gibt, sondern eine Menge Fragen aufwirft. Die ähm, 
Größe der Veranstaltung und der Mangel an Zeit erlaubt das leider jetzt nicht, in diesem großen Plenum diese Fragen zu stellen. Aber ich bin mir ganz sicher, dass Herr Lück gerne dazu bereit ist, im Rahmen des Empfangs, der jetzt gleich stattfindet, nachdem er die erste Brezel gegessen hat, auch diese, diesen Fragen und diesen Diskussionen sich zu stellen. Lassen Sie mich die Gelegenheit noch nutzen, zum Abschluss den Leuten zu danken, die hier daran beteiligt waren. Erstmal Herr Reich, vielen Dank für die Laudatio. Und dann sind auch die Veranstalter. Konrad Poltier hat die äh, Euler-Vorlesung dieses Jahr organisiert. Großer Dank an ihn, auch, insbesondere auch an Siegfried Beckus, der die ähm, ganz viel der organisatorischen Aufgaben übernommen hat. Und dann gibt es noch die ganzen vielen unsichtbaren Hände äh, der Studierenden, diese Zettel, die sie bekommen haben, oder auch jetzt bei dem Empfang, jeder Tisch, der an der richtigen Stelle steht, wurde von den Studierenden aus der Universität Potsdam dorthin getragen. Empfang. Der Empfang empfindet im Raum 056 statt. Das ist, wenn Sie jetzt da rausgehen, auf der, von mir der linken Seite bei Ihnen zur rechten, und dann die Treppe runter und dann die Tür rechts. Es muss sich nur eine Person merken und die muss als erstes dahin gehen. Und der laufen Sie alle hinterher. Genau. Sie können die Getränke äh, und gerne mit rausnehmen in die Sonne. Die Bitte ist, die äh, Gläser und auch den Pfand danach in den Raum zurückzubringen. Ähm, jetzt zum Abschluss möchte ich noch den Musikern danken, die der Veranstaltung eine Menge Gefühl und eine Menge Leichtigkeit verliehen haben. Und Sie werden jetzt die Veranstaltung noch würdevoll abschließen.